and then it totally makes sense. And so, I'm uh, so one more, one more so important announcement. My publisher, yeah. but I'm doing my own time. Mm -hmm. uh, too many people buying phone and electrons. I think it can be done. One more, yeah. uh, one more important announcement. So, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another Cavalry conversation on science communication. Uh, this is one that I'm uh, especially excited about. My name is Dan Fagan. I'm a professor of journalism here at the Carter Institute at NYU, and I'm the director of the Science Health and Environmental Reporting Program, which is a master's program for science journalism, and the Science Communication Workshops, which is a, a workshop program for scientists who want to become better communicators. So we, we are attacking the science communication uh, problem from both ends, and we're, we, we think that the work is uh, really important. But we rarely uh, uh, have a, a lot of laughs uh, doing it. And so it's, it's a, a special treat to have uh, two of the most intentionally funny people in science journalism <laughs> Uh, uh, Randall Monroe and Mary Roach. Uh, we're, we're grateful to them both very much for being here. Uh, and as always, we're very grateful to Robert Lee Holtz, Jr., uh, science writer at the Wall Street Journal and distinguished writer in residence uh, here at the Carter Institute and our able moderator. So I will turn it over to Lee. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, oh, uh, Thank you. Um, so welcome you all to the Cavalry Conversations on Science Communications. This is our second in our fall series. Um, now, our idea here is to usually bring together a leading researcher and an esteemed science journalist to explore how they best bring the general public into the community of discovery. But tonight, we're going to be exploring not research, not a shared specialty in a technical sense, but rather um, a uh, shared point of view, the power of perspective in viewing the world of research and the liberating explanatory effects of humor. So now I should say again, these conversations are sponsored by the Cavalry Foundation and the NYU Science, Health and Environmental Reporting Program uh, under the leadership of Dan Fagan. Looking ahead on October 25th, we'll explore the looming challenge of biodiversity and the end of life on this planet as we know it, <laughs> with Pulitzer Prize winning New Yorker author Elizabeth Colbert and Duke University extinction ecologist Stuart Pym. On November 10th, we'll be here digging into the animal mind with Bernard, uh, Barnard, excuse me, Barnard College psychologist and author Alexandra Horowitz, uh, whose new book, Being a Dog, has actually just come out this month and science journalist uh, Virginia Morell, author of the New York Times bestseller, Animal Wise. We'll conclude our fall conversations on December 1st with NYU social media scholar and author Dana Boyd and Wall Street Journal technology columnist Christopher Mim on cyber shaming, shunning behavior and big data. Now, this is, I wanna remind you, a conversation this evening, not a lecture. And so as we go, as Dan said, I want to encourage you here to offer your questions, but please use the microphone. And uh, those of you who are watching online can tweet, you, uh, tweet your questions to us using the hashtag CavaliConvo, which will be flashing on the screen periodically. So look, we start this conversation with our guiding question. Tonight, what can we learn when a best-selling author approaching the world of research as a curious outsider, sits down with a leading web cartoonist and writer who works from the perspective of a wry insider. 
What do their differing points of view tell us about how science is reaching the public, how it's changing, and how we might do it differently? So, if you like, this is the Cavalier Conversation POV edition. And we're going to talk with two chronic explainers. <laughs> we're joined on my left by best-selling author Mary Roach, uh, for whom there is no research subject too macabre, <laughs> weird, indelicate, or taboo to run through her word processor and onto the bestseller list. She is the author of six bestsellers on the science of, in no particular order, sex, death, digestion, the afterlife, space travel, and most recently, war, with the subject of grunt. They are stiff, spook, bonk, packing for Mars, gulp, and grunt, most recently. I should tell you that her 2009 TED Talk on the 10 things that you all don't know about orgasms has been viewed 20 million times. <laughs> has nothing at all to do with having the word orgasm in the title, nothing at all. <laughs> and marketing. <laughs> so the uh, New York Times has described her work this way. Um, delightful, eccentric scientists besotted by their spheres of study light up her pages and so does her childlike wonder. Now from Cambridge, Massachusetts, on my further left, we have Randall Monroe, creator of the wildly popular web comics uh, XKCD. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is a stick figure strip um, featuring humor about technology, science, mathematics, and relationships. Uh, but he's also um, a popular blogger and author of the bestseller, What If? Serious Scientific Answers to Absurd Hypothetical Questions, uh, which sold about 625,000 copies so far. And last year, uh, Thing Explainer, Complicated Stuff in Simple Words, which uh, uh, is a book that Microsoft uh, co-founder Bill Gates um, has called a wonderful guide for curious minds. Um, and he should know because, well, certainly he does have one. So the International Astronomical Union, I was pleased to discover, recently has named an asteroid after Randall. Oh, <laughs> man, I'm so jealous. Yeah, they've, yeah. They've discovered a lot of asteroids recently. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Can but you put in a word yeah, for me? Mary, I, I, know, I know that you're going to be relieved to know that uh, 4292 Monroe, which is this asteroid, uh, is in a stable orbit between Jupiter and Mars, which is a good thing because it is big enough to wipe out uh, life on this planet, um, should we ever collide. But it's not probably going to happen tonight. So <laughs> let me begin, Mary, by asking you. You call yourself the gateway drug to science. Uh -huh. You are, and I mean this nicely, a carnival barker of sorts, um, oh, of like yeah. sideshow science. And I'm curious, who? is your audience? Um, well, I would answer in two ways. I, I, when I'm writing, if I'm picturing anybody, it's kind of, uh, uh, you know this scene in being John Malkovich where he's in the restaurant and everybody in the restaurant is John Malkovich? <laughs> that, so it's a little bit, I'm picturing sort of an audience of Mary Roach. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, really, any, anybody with a similar sensibility and a similar curiosity, uh, I, you don't need a science background uh, to, to step into my world. So, uh, and in fact, the, the, um, I, I love it when I hear from high school students, from, from young people, and the best thing of all is when somebody says, I didn't think I was interested in science, but I read your book and now I am and I'm applying to medical school, something like that, and nothing, that just totally flips my skirt. So that's my, that's the audience that I love to have. Really, it's, but really, there's not a demographic. When my first book came out, mm -hmm. we had, you know, stiff, um, didn't like men, women, old, young. No one had a clue. So the cover was designed to not really appeal to any particular demographic. It's like, who the hell do I buy a cadaver? I don't right, know a cadaver right, book. Let's right. just put it out there. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't really. I'm writing. I'm writing. Uh, I'm writing what is um, interesting and fascinating for me, and hoping there are people out there who feel the same way. Brandon, let me ask you the same question. So who are you drawing for and writing for? <clears throat> um, I, I really answer almost the same way. Um, <clears throat> that well, were you going to flip your you know, skirt while you're doing it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, uh, 
it's it's always they always say you know know, know who your audience is and stuff but and, and but i've i've always felt like when i'm writing the way i think about it is like i just did a bunch of work and got to something cool and if i could go back in time to myself before i learned about this thing and try to give the cliff notes version of it like here's how to here's how to save all the work that i just did talking to myself you know here's the important part here's the thing that you would struggle to figure out you know um here's what i here's here's the really cool stuff and then get to leave out all of the blind alleys and and things that that didn't work um that's sort of how i think about it and so like if i'm explaining something that i learned about recently you know i think my audience is sort of me recently and if i'm writing about something you know explaining how you know like a pen or a pencil works or you know some you know what dryers what washing machines are for or whatever i i think of myself when i was trying to understand those things as a kid or i mean in the case of washing machines let's be honest a college student <laughs> <laughs> all right you know but yeah i i just think like anyone who's interested in this for the same reason i am you know here's here's the stuff that i think is cool and and if if they're interested for the same reason as me, hopefully they'll think that too. Right. So maybe in a way what we're talking about are audiences that are each driven by your own sense of yourself. I mean, you're both acting like you're doing the same thing and, and you're not. Um, Mary's readers don't annotate uh, her equations. Um, she's not, uh, you know, uh, getting uh, Reddit comments and emails about where you put your decimal point um, <laughs> in your cartoons. So you have a you have a, a, a fairly large but, but knowledgeable readership. Um, so I wonder then about this question of persona. Um, you, Mary, uh, put yourself at the forefront of each one of your books, brave, plucky Mary, sticking her nose into this, mm -hmm. running behind the special forces person, exploring the, uh, the stinkiest stink bomb ever made. I mean, whatever. I mean, you are the kind of Nellie Bly of, of science writing. And on the other hand, Randall, you are um, yourself uh, a technical, kind of a geeky sort of person. You're uh, at home with uh, root commands. Not many people are. So I'm curious, and, and perhaps uh, this will enlighten us a little bit about the two of you. Uh, Mary, so you write with a persona. You make yourself a character. Um, why? Is it like a useful thing as I, a voice, as a narrative device? I don't actually device, think that I am Nellie Bly. I think that I'm Mary Roach. <laughs> I'm just me. I mean, I'm a, I suppose I'm a, who, who's Nellie Bly? <laughs> was she the one, the early reporter checked herself into institutions? Uh, yes, about yes. Yeah, yeah, she was yeah. kind oh, of I, the, the pioneer of uh, just get that first out of the way. person. <laughs> All right, enough. <coughs> fair enough, sorry. So she was kind of the pioneer of first person oh. participatory journalism. Uh, oh, okay. Brave Nellie Bly, who, yes, checked herself into a mental institution as a way of reforming mental health in the city, right. a variety of things. Right. Like okay. I know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay, well, right. you, you got 100%. Well, I think I'm, an, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sort of a, a, maybe a caricature of myself or an exaggeration or a, little, a sliver of myself. I'm not, I don't, it's not really a persona that's separate from me. I suppose it's just a, it's a portion of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's a choice as a writer. I'm just curious why. Um, because um, it's how I most enjoy reporting and writing is just being myself, being that person. I mean, I don't see the, the persona element quite as much as you do. I mean, it's really what, what do I find interesting and what questions are, are interesting to me? That's what mm -hmm. I ask. I mm -hmm. follow my curiosity. And, and then I um, write it in sort of as it happens. And um, the more fun and interesting it is for me, the more fun and interesting I think it will be for the reader. So it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, in a similar way, um, your cartoon work, certainly, um, uh, and to a lesser extent, your, your writing. Um, but inevitably, there are a number of people who sort of read um, your web comics, uh, and they kind of just assume that they're kind of vaguely autobiographical, that they're kind of reading the adventures of Randall. Um, and well, I can see you, you're not a stick figure. And I kind of wonder where you draw the line. <laughs> um, I don't know. 
I, th I think that um, one of the uh, one of the fun things about about doing especially like kind of uh, cartoons in general, but like simple, uh, uh, you know, caricatures of, of familiar situations or whatever is how easy it is to put yourself in the the in what you read. You know, and, and this is sort of like anyone doing, you know, the kind of observational comedy or or writing about like these worker life situations. Um, it's I think one of the advantages of the kind of the more simple stick figure or um, <clears throat> you know uh, style or like even you know newspaper comics like w what I grew up reading um, is that that the kind of lack of of details makes it a little bit easier to fill it in with your own life and to see yourself in it and so uh, I think that that in a in a way that that, that helps people connect a little bit. So I'm curious now. We're talking, you know, in a in a in a kind of event that's being framed as a discussion about sort of humor and science. So God help all of us, right? But I'd have to ask, you know, the is science by and large too self-important to actually be readily understood? I mean, is that why you think you've struck such a popular appeal, the two of you? I don't know. I think, I think. Um, I think. I don't think that it's too yeah. self-important. Pompous. To, no, no. I think it's it's just the science is directed at other scientists, and it and, and people are mostly writing for their peers, and it's and it's uh, uh, be, to those of us who don't have the background to understand what's being said, it it it's a little inaccessible. But I don't I don't find it self-important or pompous. Yeah, I, th I think that. Um, I think people like to laugh about things, and and it's just sort of part of how we, like, what makes us enjoy stuff, how we experience things. And I mean, I feel like scientists have the things that they laugh at, and sometimes it's something that is accessible to the outside world, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's not, because you know, like like any any humor, it it you know comes out of experience with something or expectations or whatever. Um, actually, now and then you'll find a, a scientific paper that's. Um, either a joke or like maybe an inside joke or maybe a little bit more accessible. I think my favorite one was there's a psychology paper from maybe the 70s that was um, uh, from psychology, some kind of medicine. And it said uh, a case report on the unsuccessful treatment of a uh, case of writer's block. And the paper was blank. <laughs> and it was published in some journal. And, and I really appreciated that. Um, <laughs> And it was just, you know, I, I, I don't know if I would have stumbled on that if I hadn't been like researching something else. But, you know, I th feel like there's a lot of humor in there, humor between scientists, humor of scientists talking to the outside world, outside world talking about scientists. I mean, I think everyone likes to laugh. No, it's true. But jokes, of course, have a, can work in two ways. I mean, they draw a circle around people who get the punchline. Mm -hmm. um, or they can be a way of drawing people who, who don't, or are not into a circle. And it seems to me that the two of you kind of come to this from those two directions. I mean, a lot of your early work is very like, if you get a pseudo joke, you get it. If you don't, you don't. Um, and you, on the other hand, are interpreting for the rest of us. You know? um, so. I think I would add, though, mm -hmm. um, on the topic of you know, are, are scientists too serious? Do they take themselves too seriously? Um, some of the m most delightful humor in my books um, comes from these wonderful individuals who have this passion for something that, like I was talking to some students earlier about, there's a researcher in Gulp who studies saliva. She mm -hmm. has a lab where she studies saliva, and um, she's this beautiful Italian woman who is passionate about saliva, and who, to the point where she described being at a conference with a bunch of dental people and going home in tears and calling her boyfriend and saying, they think it's just for moisturizing food. <laughs> and, you know, she had this, and I, I loved her, and I, I, mean, there, I mean, the humor is not in, in, a, in a like, oh, you're it's ridiculous, she takes yeah, it. Yeah, just, yeah, it's yeah. just the, the, the kind of surrealness of someone whose, whose life work is, is devoted to studying 
the properties of saliva and the kind of miraculous, I mean, spit is pretty miraculous, I now know. But, it, but, but um, just, you know, her passion for it and the fact that she's this beautiful, well-dressed Italian woman and she studies spit. Anyway, sometimes the seriousness that is applied to things that we see as just silly or gross is inspiring and funny at the same time. Yeah. But so yeah, I, I like to mine Yeah, that. no, I mean, yeah. I think that, that the two of you are a great, the, I, I think Aristotle was supposed to say this, but he forgot that, you know, comedy is, is, is as serious as tragedy, it's just faster. You know, <laughs> um, that your work actually is tackles some like very serious things. Grunt's a good example yeah. of that. Um, and uh, the, uh, well, which we'll get to in a minute, we'll talk about the thing explainer, but um, you know, the, the topics themselves are not funny right. in, a, in a kind of vaudeville sense. Um, and there is some alchemy, though, between the obsessive, necessarily obsessive yes. quality of the researchers, the topic and your sensibility and your sensibility that makes these things somehow float, you know? Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, what, Randall, in your search for hypothetical questions, um, was your favorite? unlikely question. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I really like, I, uh, I like the, the questions that sort of take me in a direction that I wasn't really expecting. Um, and one of the ones that uh, someone asked about, and, and, I, and what I also like is when, when the, the questioner clearly has something in mind, but you can, but the actual answer kind of goes somewhere you know they weren't they weren't planning it to. Um, there was one, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite in there was uh, about, <clears throat> someone asked if you, what if you had a bullet with the density of, an, of the material in a neutron star and you fired it at the ground, you know, what would it do? Um, and, and sort of the answer to that question is, is that it would, it would fall, it, you know, this, this would weigh as much as like several blocks of Manhattan, it would fall right through the ground and, and and actually could kind of disappear into the earth and then there wouldn't be very many more consequences. But I was thinking, you know, to hold it in a gun, you'd need some kind of material to, to support it. And then once you've got that assumption, you've got this super heavy object and it would be heavy enough to pull on its surroundings, but not quite enough to like, you know, it's not gonna like cause some apocalyptic consequences. It would just mean that gravity near this gun before it was fired um, would mean that down, like anywhere in the room, down would sort of point toward the gun. And then I started thinking, well, what if you just like have water nearby? It would start flowing around the, the gun and you'd end up getting this weird lava lamp shape of water. Um, and then I was thinking, okay, well, what if you like tried to swim in that? <laughs> um, and I think maybe my favorite thing, and, and that ended up being a lot of calculations because I, I, I was trying to model like, you know, I, I worked out the, the, the shape of the water because like if the blob gets large enough, the Earth's gravity starts being stronger and it pulls it down to the ground. Um, and so I have a drawing of this, this weird blob of water with like ducks and boats floating around <laughs> on it. Um, and, and I thought that was such a surreal scene. And that's not at all where, you know, the questioner I think was hoping to destroy the Earth. And instead, <laughs> instead it ended up as this bizarre like, um, like pond that has never been seen before, <laughs> probably never will. And I like that image. So Mary, you've taken on a lot of different um, things, saliva, um, in your in your books. Um, I'm curious, um, your a version of the same question for you. So, spit, stiffs, uh, penile transplants, uh, the perfect zipper. I mean, what what is the thing that really, um, in your career now, stands out in in your head as the thing that you're really happiest to have learned about? Um, I think I, when I was working on packing for Mars, I was just eternally amazed at the degree to which anything, any machine, including the human body, just doesn't function when you put it in zero gravity. And, and, and meaning that engineers had this, just anything had to be completely like reworked and rejiggered and all this money was spent on trying to get beer to function, you know, but carbonation didn't work because, you know, the bubbles didn't rise, it kind of just sort of fizzed around. And, and even if you, and they managed to make it work, and then 
Um, the astronauts, uh, because they couldn't burp, because the, get, the bubbles wouldn't rise and there wasn't the, you know, the, the air building up at the top of the stomach that would then come up, they felt very uncomfortable. So all this money was spent to give them beer or Coca-Cola in zero gravity, and then they're like, I can't burp, I feel awful, and the whole thing. Anyway, that, I was endlessly entertained and amazed by how the extent to which just nothing works, everything has to be rethought, what if, and um, so that, that book uh, you know, just was, you know, and, and the human, even the, like the human bladder, like you know, how that works by uh, you know, stretch receptors, and the material has to kind of build up on the bottom, and it kind of expands, and then it lets you know doesn't happen, it's zero gravity, it all kind of by surface tension is all over the bladder so you don't get the cue. And you, so the astronauts would have to be toilet trained. They'd have to like take them aside and say, look, you're gonna have to like go every couple of hours even if you don't need to. And just the complexity of like, how do you plant a flag on the moon? Well, I'd like how much, so we don't even know and it's not gotta, well, it's not gonna wave in the breeze, there's no breeze, so it's gonna be like a patriotic curtain hanging. And <laughs> like that, so many, and like, it was like a 20 page paper on the, that, the planting of the flag and all the complexities and things that they realized weren't gonna, they were gonna be a challenge, they're gonna have to rejigger and figure out and like, anyway, that constantly amazed me and I love, I just, that's the kind of science that I, I uh, love. Those, sorts, those surprises were just something that you take for granted as straightforward suddenly becomes this perplexing engineering challenge. I think it was John Young, was it not, who famously complained that when he was on the moon astronaut, John Young, um, uh, on the moon complained about the uh, gas that he was getting from having to drink Tang. Um, which was, and yeah, all this was going out on live audio, these <laughs> strange, yeah, well, moon yes. rumbles, <coughs> strange moon rumbles. No, he, no. yeah, so, uh, and he, yeah, um, he, he was bad-mouthing oranges, the same, ah. like saying, you know, you, you know I think it was, because fabulously, those mission transcripts, which are about a thousand pages long, are searchable by keywords, so you can look oh, up okay. Belch if you want to. Ah. Yeah, and, and so he, yeah, they're giving him Tang, actually for the potassium, because there were some astronauts with heart murmurs, and they were concerned about heart problems, and so they had to give, they had the potassium and the Tang, and so he was having to drink it. It leaked. He was out, actually on the moon with Tang sort of coming down his face and all over his visor, and he, they said to him, you know, what do you see in the distance? And he named two meteors. He's like, I can see, these were, um, they were landscape features on the moon. I, I can see wreck and trap and orange juice. <laughs> <laughs> it's all over. And then he goes, and then he's like, they, he doesn't know the microphone's on, and he's saying, he's going, uh, you know, I like the occasional orange, I really do, but I'll be damned. Okay, the guy's like this rant about oranges. And then, and then like the NASA had to do this apology to the Florida Orange Juice Association. Right? Like, yeah. And the orange juice people, the Florida orange juice people are like, these are not our oranges. This is an artificial drink that we have nothing to do with. So it was this, yeah, anyway. Uh, I, I love that stuff. <laughs> So, you, but you've kind of given us a flavor, though, of your of your reporting on this sort of thing, which is meticulous. Um, and so, Randall, I'm kind of curious when you are confronted with a a question like, and I'm just going to pick one at random. I mean, really and truly, there are no paper clips in here. Um, you know, if every person on Earth aimed a laser pointer at the moon at the same time, would it change color? I mean, how do you approach that as a research task, as a <coughs> as a uh, as a writer? Um, I mean, I think that it's sort of, the, the, the first thing is I'm, I, I want to know the answer regardless of whether I'm going to write about it or not. You know, it's like I'm, I'm, my favorite question is the ones where right away I'm like hooked. Um, and, I, and I feel like it's, it's a lot like getting a song stuck in your head where like once you've heard it, it's like you can't, you can't drop it until you've like tried to work it out. Um, and so like with that one though, <clears throat> um, I think sort of the same way that, that that like in physics, you know, you solve an unknown problem or any, is, the, is the, the first step is just thinking, well, what do I already know that I might be able to put together to get me to this answer? Um, and there's, there's a category of problem called Fermi problems, which are, which are it's like the, the, the classic one is how many piano tuners are there in Chicago? And, and the idea is, you know, you, of course you have no firsthand information on that, but you can think, what percentage of people would be wealthy enough to own a piano? What, you know, how many, if you're a piano tuner, how many houses can you visit in a day? How often do pianos need to be tuned? And like putting all those things together, you can come up with an estimate that gets you to the answer. 
And so I really like that process of like thinking, what do I know, like, or what, what can I easily find out that I might be able to, you know, put together several of these things to get me to the answer. So with the, the moon laser pointer question, <clears throat> like I remember hearing that the moon isn't very reflective. Um, it's like the color of, of uh, old uh, uh, sidewalk or like pavement um, parking lot. Um, and it's, and like, I know laser pointers are limited to five milliwatts um, because, you know, more than that, you can burn eyes. And it turns out you can buy much more powerful ones online. Um, they, they actually won't ship to the US unless you have a letter from the FDA. And I, I don't think, it, I'm guessing no one has ever tried. Um, but if you know someone in Canada, you can get them to order a laser pointer and then they can sneak it to you. This is going to end up getting someone so the arrested. FDA, not the FAA. So the FDA. my right. my theory is that they everyone who owns a cat has a laser pointer. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, so and, and and so most laser pointers are five milliwatts, and oh, uh, yeah. you can buy these ones that are like one watt, oh, okay. which doesn't sound like a lot, but one watt in a very small area. And if they have videos, you can pop balloons with them. Um, mm -hmm. You can probably start a fire if you point them at something. Um, so it's like no longer eye damage territory. It's just damage in general. <laughs> um, yeah, well, what I love on their website, they had the, the company that sells these. They said, unless you have a letter from the FDA. And I, and that was, I thought that same thing. Yeah. That seems strange. And my theory is no one has ever called them on that. <laughs> I yeah, think no right. one has ever sent them a letter. Um, so I was tempted to see if I could just, just to find out if they were bluffing or not. Um, but, <clears throat> but then I couldn't. I did, there was no problem that that would help me solve, so, ex <laughs> except the problem of me not having a really powerful laser. Um, See, if you were me, you would have just put it in a footnote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I th <clears throat> um, uh, or encourage someone else to potentially commit what might be a crime <laughs> and, and then not get you in trouble. Um, but yeah, so, so with the laser pointer one, it's like, okay, I know offhand the power of lasers. I know from like doing a lighting calculation roughly how much, how much visible light you get per, you know, watt of energy from these different kinds of lasers. And like, I know how many people there are in the world. Um, and then I, uh, suddenly, wait, I know how many people there are on one side of the world at once. Okay, I can figure out the population of Asia and Europe and Africa. So when they're all pointed at, you know, and like putting those pieces together, I can get to where I can at least get an approximate answer. And if it's close, if it's like, well, it might be visible, might not, then, okay, I've got to refine this more. Now I've got to go look for more pieces of information. Um, and, and, and sometimes there'll be a missing piece. And then it's like, okay, I, now I need to go out and find that missing piece. And then sometimes that process takes me to somewhere I didn't expect. Um, and I think that, that that's always the most fun part is when like you're trying to solve this one problem and then you end up uh, finding research that you didn't even know uh, existed. My favorite example of that was when I was trying to solve a question about um, how fast you have to drive over a speed bump um, before you'll die. <laughs> like, and, and, Did and you I, approach this empirically? I mean. No, well, so. Um, and, and I ended up looking, uh, I was thinking, okay, there's gotta be some good research on this, you know, sa traffic safety. There's lots of writing on traffic safety, but, but no one seems to really have, have this question. And so I, I, I wound up reading this, the best stuff I think is always in old photocopied d documents, originally from the Department of Defense or whatever. <laughs> um, but I ended up reading this Xerox, it was an article in, about like spinal injury from, from buses, but, it was in the Proceedings on the Second International Conference on Human Vibration. Oh, yeah. Oh. And right away I was oh, like, famous, yeah. I want to read what the other things in this, in this <laughs> are. And so I like completely lost interest in the bus paper and was like, I want to look at the table of contents because not only is there an entire article on human vibration, whatever that is, but there have been two of them at least. Oh yeah, I was, yeah. I was, I, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> there. Well, so my yeah. first thought was that this would I, it turned out not to be the exciting kind of vibration. Um, it's like, <laughs> it's like, um, um, like you know, on rockets. And, yeah, and it, it, it was like how uh, it was like um, um, OSHA safety. If you're going to be working around jackhammers oh, right, yeah. or yeah. vehicles that drive on bumpy road, how fast can you make them drive before you're in risk of causing your employee's spinal fracture or whatever? Um, and so there was a lot of that. But my favorite, my favorite tidbit from that was that somewhere in one of the other papers that I ended up reading, um, 
they had an equation for like compression of the spine based on bumpiness of the road, shock absorbers, the cushion of the seat and so on. And then they had a line where they said, and then we will add this term to the equation corresponding to the elasticity of the buttocks. <laughs> And I think I just stopped right there and just stared at that for a little while. I was like, I'm so glad I found this. And I think that's the really fun stuff is like you're trying to solve a problem and then you end up yeah. in some weird avenue that you hadn't expected. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, I remember, yeah. yeah. No, so, I was going to say there's yeah. a, it was, um, uh, I had a chapter for Gulp that had to do with chewing and oral processing. And they were talking about when you chew, what you're doing is you're taking this food item and you're breaking it down and then you're putting it back together and you're, you're um, putting it into the swallowable state, which I just love because I'm like, I think Rhode Island would be a swallowable <laughs> state. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I, I love the, like jargon and mm -hmm. ter really specific terms that are not very often used. Yeah. So I'm just curious now if we can linger for a second on the buttocks. Um, what do you do when you find a gem that you weren't prospecting for? I mean, both of you have spent a lot of time going up, not blind alleys necessarily, but, you know. Prospecting for gems. Prospecting totally, for gems. Totally, um, Now, you were looking, I don't know what you were looking for when you started out the, and ended up at the conference, second conference on human vibration, but there you were with a gem. What do you do with it? Um, I, I think that if it's cool enough, that's now what my article is about. <laughs> like, um, right. I, I completely uh, 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 will will change the, what I'm writing about, or or uh, uh, just to figure out a way to work in this cool thing. Um, um, there so was you a just question. Oh, the yeah. hell with lasers on the moon. Let's well, go yeah, I mean, it. like we can have a digression here about about this, or figure out if there's a way I can explain it that lets me talk about that, or you know. Stick it in a in a random footnote, um, you know, or occasionally just set it aside. I, I don't know if you have oh, sort of a oh, file of like well, this is going to be yes. random footnotes. Yeah. You have the best footnotes. Y yeah, I mean, you find a gem, and you do what anybody who has a gem is. You find a setting mm -hmm. for it to shine. Ooh. You know, you, you the, I the, I will just I, it may not fit exactly in the context in which I found it, but I I'm gonna fit it in. If I have to, I'll put it in a footnote, but I would prefer to yeah. work it in somewhere in an actual Can you give us discussion. An oh, uh, oh, gosh. I got so, there's so many of them that I can't, I don't even know where to begin uh, an example of a, a gem. Um, that thing you weren't looking for. The thing I wasn't looking for. Most things I'm not looking for. I head <laughs> off, like, you know, like I'll be. Uh, um, yeah, you know, for example, for, for Bonk, there was one morning where I just went into the, the medical school library in the basement where the old, all the journals are, and I just sat down with the Journal of Sex Research. And I just, one at a time, went through it, and it was like boring, 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 boring. And then I would come upon like um, sexual intercourse as a potential treatment for intractable hiccups. <laughs> like, and that, and not even just like, that's fabulous right there, but then if you read the paper, it, uh, um, it, it, there's, there's a point where they, they give advice for people who are not in relationships and say that you know that you could try masturbation could be tried and they and like they said oh for, but what I loved is they said unattached hiccupers could try <laughs> masturbation <laughs> and I just love there's a demographic unattached <laughs> hiccupers so right. I saw I mean I saw the paper I'm like yeah that should probably be in but then when I got to the unattached hiccupers I'm like this is going somewhere I'm not leaving the unattached hiccupers out of this book someone. Who do you think they support politically? Someone has to have polled that group. <laughs> <laughs> and they all must yeah. live in a swallowable state. They live <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I don't know, there's so, yeah, there's so many of them. I yeah. think um, um, my favorite recently was someone wrote about, uh, 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 someone asked a question that I thought was gonna be a physics question that was, um, what would happen if you tried to funnel the entire flow of Niagara Falls through a drinking straw? And, <laughs> And, and first I thought, oh, I know how to solve this. It's these choked flow equations. And then I start trying to apply them and very quickly realize that instead of the water moving at near the speed of sound where the choked flow equations are really in play, the water will be moving at near the speed of light where different equations come into play. But then, 
<laughs> but then, then while I was doing this, I'm like, okay, I need to figure out how much water is flowing over Niagara Falls. And, and right away, that led me to, there's a treaty that governs how much water can flow over Niagara Falls. Indeed. And yeah, yeah. because it's like used for hydroelectric power, but it's also a tourist attraction and it's on the border between two countries. So one country could have an incentive to like, well, they're using water for power, we'll use some too. And, and, and before long, the falls are completely shut, shut off. So there's a treaty that specifies how much water flows over the falls. And I'm like, okay, great. But I noticed that they mentioned that in the treaty, which was most recently renewed or ratified in the 1950s, it, there's an officer assigned by the United States and by Canada to jointly m monitor the water flow over the falls um, for any like treaty violations. And so I started wanting to know, who are these people? <laughs> because by law, they're empowered. They're the waterfall police. Right. Yeah. So then I, I'm like, OK, I'm going to Google who these people are. And I can't find it. And and finally, and I end up on, it turns out there's like six different committees all overlapping, like one for each Great Lake, one for the Great Lakes as a whole, one for like the, the, the flow between the Great Lakes, like all of them, and they're all like, they all have web pages from, you know, probably the 90s, unchanged, you know, and they're, they're all like, it's, lots of people are on like five of the committees, and one of the web pages had a whole bunch of Viagra ads, even though it was clearly a government site. And I think has not, no one has looked at it in years. <laughs> but I couldn't find, and I finally ended up like paging through an org chart. Like it was like a presentation from their annual meeting. And on slide like 80, they mentioned, the current officers have been designated, and they're so-and-so from Environment Canada, and so-and-so from uh, the, the US, like NOAA, some kind of commissioned officer. Yeah. And I was like, I've got their names. Yeah. But I really yeah. liked, and you know, I'm sure that they, I'm sure that it's really like in practice really boring. They're like, so, you know, what's the latest flow pumping station, the pumping station, so and so. Yeah. And, yeah. But I like to think that they're like a Mulder and Scully kind of, <laughs> 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 like yeah. if the water is missing from the waterfall, they're empowered to return it by any yeah. means necessary. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that article ended up being like 20% about physics and 80% about the politics yeah, of yeah. watersheds between yeah. the US and Canada. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you didn't go to them with the straw. No, no. Um, I, 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 the, I could be committing an international crime. <laughs> like, I, I think if I, uh, uh, I think, I, I don't know, at, I feel like at this point, just by revealing their org chart, <laughs> I know it was on their web page, but maybe they didn't realize it because those web pages are not well maintained. Maybe that wasn't supposed to be a public document. Maybe I've leaked these secrets of this international organization, you know? Yeah. And, and so, so I decided not to reach out to them. I felt like just I'll put their name in there and then hopefully I haven't gotten like blown someone's cover. Um. I got very distracted when I came up. There was uh, two studies that I came across that had um, used um, artificial semen. And they had, they actually, the paper included the recipe. And one of them, uh, one of them was cornstarch based and one was flour based. <laughs> And they were very specific to the point where, you know, in a recipe, you know, they have the ingredients and then they'll be like, yield. And it was like, <laughs> yeah, yield, one ejaculate. And it was like, you know, stamps like five, is that you know, like a, a dozen metric, cupcakes. Um, uh, or is <laughs> so uh, anyway, and then, I, and, then I, and then I tried to persuade my publicist that we should, we should do uh, a little Mary Roach cookbook because every, there's always recipes that come up in all these books and they're... <laughs> Didn't go anywhere. No. You could also yeah. just make an account on one of those like Epicurious or whatever recipe huh. sites and just start uploading those recipes and see if anyone notices. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do at one of my uh, my events to do like a, a, a cooking show where we would actually you know whip it up and, and um, huh. uh, it, anyway it was it was shot down. Um, I, maybe just as well. So we have a, a question. Uh, as much as I love talking about artificial ejaculate, is this on? No, yeah. you're not going to hear yourself. Um, so what I wanted to know was, uh, how do you make sure what you are doing is funny and not uh, either offensive or that you're actually making sure to get your points across? Hmm. Yeah, is there a line you dare not cross uh, somewhere? Yeah, and the, the, I do cross it, and I, I, uh, I, I think um, I, I'm fortunate to have an editor who has a better barometer of that than I do. I think that I'm, I'm not the best judge of when I may have crossed the line. So there are things that she will just cross out and say, no. <laughs> and she's always right. I mean, I don't cross it too often, um, but there are, there are times when I'm just, I just lose control. Not, 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 at anybody, not at anybody's expense, but just tasteless. 
I can be a little t tasteless. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> Do you have a, a dark place where you dare not go for fear of uh, the Reddit hordes or just simply your own uh, no. sense of tact? I think that actually the biggest thing for me that I, that I try to be really careful about and, and steer clear of is, is people who ask questions that are sort of phrased as, as science or physics questions or, or presented to me like that, but, but answering them involves like stepping into like uh, sociology or politics in a way where I think people who kind of have a veneer of science and then go to talk about something kind of outside their field can do a lot of damage um, by lending their credibility to something where they don't really know what they're talking about. Um, so I'll have people ask me kind of hypothetical questions, but it'll be like, uh, you know, maybe convoluted in some way, but it'll be effectively like, what if this country never had never existed? How would history in that area be different? You know, where it's like, that's an interesting question, but it really, you, you need, you know, someone with some kind of historical expertise, not, it's not just a geography or, or uh, you know, not just like a, a geology question of like, what if this landmass had never risen? It's, you know, they're asking a cultural question here. Or um, um, people will ask, ask questions about, um, there was one that I thought was a cool question about reintroducing uh, predators to the, uh, dinosaurs to the savanna in mm -hmm. Africa, mm -hmm. and how would they fit into the ecosystem there? And, and right away I was like, okay, cool, this is a biology, you know, this is like a, 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 you know, I'll talk to some biology people about this. And then it turns out that, that the thing that really pressures predators in the ecosystem there is poaching and, hmm. and a lot of political issues. It, it's, um, it's all about the people and the governmental systems there and how well they would protect the dinosaurs and how well, you know, it, the, a T-Rex would be probably shot by poachers the same way uh, lions are. And so really what would happen to them is ultimately kind of a political question. And it's one where, where I know there's a huge amount of tension around that right now and a huge amount of you know, people pushing in different directions and people um, weighing human versus animal, you know, what's best for them. And I was like, I'm gonna make sure, I, I wanna make sure I know what I'm stepping into there before I start saying what I think should be done about ecosystems in Africa, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think that's the kind of thing where I, I don't want to, so, you know, Randall Monroe, who has, is, writes about science, says this, so it must be true. And it's like, if it's in an area like a, a really political area like that, I feel like that can, can, can be harmful. And I like, I try to, try to be conscious of that. Uh, I'm, I tend to tread carefully uh, anytime things turn to religion and also, uh, Animals, people get, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I'll mention historically some study that was done that involved animals, dead or alive, and, and that's when I hear from people, not, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, not angry at me, but just I found people saying, I, I found that really upsetting. I had a hard time reading that. Uh, so I watch my step there. Yeah. Um, same, yeah. The same. Uh, well, that's interesting. I mean, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I, I feel obliged to confess that as a, a lifelong newspaper journalist, I, I have no sense of humor. Um, <laughs> it's beaten out of me a long time ago uh, for precisely the reasons that you're saying, that, that uh, it's too prone to misinterpretation. It's too prone to irritate the one person you don't want to irritate or offend the one person right. you don't want to offend who is your reader. So I'm kind of curious about this. You traffic in stuff that is perhaps guaranteed maybe to piss off some group of your, uh, some percentage of your, of your readers. I'm just wondering to f just linger on his question for a minute. I think is it enough I just simply to have an editor who has a little red flag no, that says, that Mary, back off, you know. I what? think also that the books self-select for somebody with a sensibility that is a little more freewheeling and, and not super sensitive or PC. I don't think my books, I mean, that's who tends to, I mean, based, mm -hmm. on, I mean, I rarely hear from people who were offended. I, I try to aim the humor at myself mm -hmm. rather than anybody in, in the book. Um, but I, I do feel like the, the, the whole kind of aesthetic of the books and the titles, you know, it kind of, it self-selects for a, a certain reader who's, who's not terribly delicate in, in terms of PC-ness or, or taking offense. 
No, uh, okay. Well, sure, PC, I guess. I wasn't quite what I meant, but I mean, you in particular, and, and in a different way, you, Randall, but I mean, you, you know, half of, half of well, a good percentage of grunt is about people dealing with war wounds. Yes, or, right. And this is yes. grim stuff. Mm -hmm. And yet you bring a kind of liveliness to it, and I, don't, and I mean that in the yeah, most well, complimentary the way possible. Of, right, in the case of These grunt. These horrible, uh, well, yeah. Sure, but a lot of, I mean, the, the, there's a couple of historical chapters, uh, the OSS mm -hmm. and their efforts to create a shark repellent in one case and a um, stink paste in another. So you know, that's a pretty safe terrain for humor. Uh, and also my status as a clueless outsider is, is another source of humor that isn't going to offend anyone because I'm the idiot. You know, like I'm the person, mm. I'll be in a you know, um, mine-resistant arms personnel carrier being shown, like what have they done to make this safer? It's a very heavy vehicle, so they can't add any weight that doesn't go toward protectiveness, so there's no toilet, there's no microwave, and these are long journeys. And I say, well, it's great that you kept cup holders. And the guy's like, Mary, those are rifle holders. I mean, just my, <laughs> just, just my kind of, I'm just, I'm clueless because it's a, it's a foreign culture to me, the military. So, so some of the humor comes from, from that, uh, but definitely with that book, more concern and treading more cautiously than any of the others. You look like you have a thought there. Oh no, I was saying I think that's my favorite thing um, about about your writing is is both of the questions where you're like, you know, you you actually get to ask the question that we'd all sort of be wondering, but then and then not want to ask, or it yeah. would be like, well, what if that's a dumb question, you know? Yeah. But we're all really curious. Um, and then and then, but my very favorite is is the questions where you're like, you ask three or four questions, and then. And then you have another question that you decide is too much and you don't ask, and so you just put in a footnote. And yeah, you know, or yeah. like, at this point I wanted to ask this, but they started yeah, to right, seem right. test. I, I, I really <laughs> love, I love that kind of uh, internal right. monologue of like the questions that even you were like, yeah, like even I'm I curious did. about this, but I'm gonna leave that <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah, but you're still sharing. So a uh, question here. Hi, um, so as people with millions of readers, uh, does it, I mean, it, sometimes I'm sure it feels like you're just projecting out into some kind of void. You don't get immediate feedback on what right. you're putting out to those millions. Um, but you've mentioned you get letters back from people. What are the coolest sort of echoes back from hmm. your readership that either of you have received? Um, m my favorite letter of all time was this guy who wrote and said, um, I, I work as a line chef somewhere in New York. and." Um, I have a long subway ride out to Queens, and I, I look around me, and the only people who don't look bored are the people reading books. And I thought, all right, I need to read a book. I don't <laughs> read books. I went to my sister. I'm like, what do I read? She says, read this book, Stiff, by Mary Roach. So, so I sat down, and I read it, and I said, now I know why they don't look bored. And now I, now I not only... I not only read books, but I have a favorite author. And it was like, it was Aww. so, I, I, I kept that letter. I love that letter. Yeah, anyway, that was, that was, that's the, I, that, my favorite letter. Yeah? Aww. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and of course, you know, you have websites devoted to ripping you apart. So, so what's, what's the, what's the bright thing for you? What's um, the, no, I think my favorite thing that I've heard is, um, now and then I'll get people who, who will say that they met, uh, uh, they met someone by sending comics back and forth to each other, or because one of them had a t-shirt or something, and they started talking about my comic, and then got married, and now and then I'll get wedding photos, and that's, oh, yeah. that's just like yeah. the sweetest thing in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I don't know, it's also fun to get, um, um, when I write an article about something where I've done my best to answer a question, then I hear from someone who's like, the expert who I didn't even know existed and wanted to contact and like would have loved to hear from, but now I get to find out more. Um, like the very first article I wrote was on throwing a baseball at 90% of the speed of light. Oh, yes. And I did a bunch of physics calculations, um, you know, and got what I thought was, you know, the, the best answer I could come up with. And then I heard from someone who was like, hey, I'm so-and-so at, uh, at the MIT high energy physics lab and we've passed around your article. And so I took the liberty of simulating it on our computers here, and I've got some data for you. And I was like, yes, oh, man. And I got to like, see like, which things I had gotten right, which things were like, wrong, you know, whatever. Just got to, to, you know, the baseball heats more uniformly than I thought it would. Like, <laughs> like it was really interesting. Um, um, and I love, I love that kind of thing, too. Hello. 
Um, so your research takes you in a bunch of really interesting directions and often some that you didn't think that you would be going down necessarily. And I was wondering, um, what do you do with the realities of time constraints and when do you know that you're, you're done? And when do you know that you have to like put it down and move on and start writing or start drawing? Oh, you mean when am I done with the, when are we with the, done with the research and have to start writing? You mean? Or, or if you get like caught up in uh, in a loop where you just keep finding interesting tidbits that lead you to another one, and it's sort of down this rabbit hole that you didn't realize you were uh, I, going I to go be going down, that day. Yeah, I go down every rabbit hole because mm -hmm. yeah. I'm ha I'm happiest in in a rabbit hole. That's where I want to be. Um, but I do, you know, like there are the constraints of a of a deadline and. Um, it's, it's just largely in, intuitive, the sense of, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've gone and reported, I have the narrative from where I went and what I saw, and I know what the scenes are going to be and what should, what I need to plug in where to flesh out the chapter, and uh, it just, it, it kind of feels done. And as for the book itself, you know, you, you know, you go over and over and over a book, you know, micro-editing it, and I, when I'm in that process, uh, there's a point where, <laughs> the paragraphs develop this Teflon layer where I cannot make myself get back, I can't get back, it just, my eyes just skate over it, like I can't mm -hmm. read that one more time, I'm done. And then eventually the whole book has that kind of, it's like I can't do, and I've got to hand it off to my editor and let her tell me what to, what to go back to and change. So just to hang here for a second, then I'm going to ask a version of her question to you, Randall. But so, okay, so, but you're writing a book, right? Uh, not a 400 word, so just typically, um, how long does it take you to research one of those remarkable books over there on that table? Uh, two, three years. Two or three uh -huh. years. Okay. Uh -huh. And then to research and write. Oh, yes. research and write. Because I'm doing both at the same time. Well, yeah. I'm, oh, you I'm write as you go. Yeah, I write as I go. Wow. I do. If I get it, once I have the stuff for a chapter, I want to write. I got to have the the done pile building up, the done pages, and so it's not just to do, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, and I may need to ch change the order and move it around, but I'd rather do that than have just this pile of material getting bigger and bigger and the time running out. So I dive in and write a chapter as soon as I can. So you can, you're like a very organized person? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. When you go down the rabbit hole, you tie a rope around your waist? <laughs> uh, well, the, you know, the rabbit holes are, they're fairly small rabbit holes. Typically, they're self-limiting. <laughs> they're, yeah. So, Randall, you maintain a, a posting schedule um, with your uh, strip mm -hmm. um, three times a week. Mm -hmm. um, you also clearly have larger projects. You also blog. So, uh, here, Mary's got a, a long time frame, but she's got a focus. If I, mm -hmm. you on the other hand have got this other set of disciplinary things you have to respond to. So how would you answer her question through the lens of your many deadlines, self-imposed yeah, deadlines? I, I don't know. I think, I think um, for, for a lot of people, even who do comics and stuff, like the, the deadline pressure is a big, it you know, forces you to kind of pare things down and decide what you're going um, to not just stay down rabbit holes forever. And, and for me, um, I feel like the the rabbit holes, especially with um, what if articles, are not self limiting in in the sense that like, especially if you're just kind of exploring something that you're curious about, like like the waterfall question. That was I, I probably literally spent like four or five hours on those web pages trying to find the names of those waterfall police, and there's like I did not have to do that. <laughs> and then and then I wanted to know who hacked their website and. Who, <laughs> Who should I report this? You know, is this and and like any of these things could lead to you know all five of those committees have you know or whatever have their internal politics that I was learning about reading this you know, yeah. and it's like that that can go go forever. So right. part of it for me is it's like, all right, I'm I'm gonna just have to say I'm not gonna spend two days on this waterfall question. Yeah. I've, I'm gonna you I'm gonna cut my losses at some at point and point. back up. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, have you changed your mind? Do you still have a question? You think you changed your mind? Okay. So, so I'd like to linger on something that uh, has to do with Randall's latest project, which is the Thing Explainer, which I'm not going to. Well, let's pull it out here because it's a, um, a complicated stuff in simple words. And 
I think many of the people here in this audience are journalists or people who are um, experimenting with science writing. And you did a very interesting, you set yourself a very interesting limit here. You decided that you were going to write about very complicated stuff with only the 1,000 wor words that people most commonly use. And, and I'd, I'd like you to explain to us, first of all, why you decided to do that and what happened. And then I want to linger for a bit on the barriers of language and some of the things that we're trying to talk about here. So, so what on earth? Is this like a, a, a something left over from like your programming days? I know I'll set a boundary condition. Won't that be fun? Um, sort, well, sort of. I think it was so. At, at one point, I had the idea of of um, of uh, I was naming rockets in a video game, and I started giving them really dumb names. And then I I had a rocket called Upgoer, and I started thinking, all right, that's a pretty dumb name. I guess that you'd call the different parts on this with similarly dumb names, like you know, instead of the exhaust nozzle, it'll be the fire hole or something. <laughs> and, and then I was thinking, okay, I wanna see if I can label the entire rocket using this constraint. And then probably because I'm a programmer, I immediately was like, I'm not just gonna give it dumb names, I wanna formalize this somehow. <laughs> and so then I spent an entire day trying to decide on a way to define the thousand most common words in English and like assemble word lists and you know, that ended up being a rabbit hole and then, um, but I found that, that trying to describe stuff using that constraint, which initially I was thinking was just a fun way to get silly names for things, um, ended up really being a fun challenge because it's like I couldn't use any, any technical word without instead like, how do I explain what this word means, not just use it and not worry too much about it. Um, uh, and that made me like have to stop and think about a bunch of stuff like, you know, I'm talking about the hydrogen in the fuel tanks. How do I explain? I, I can't say the word hydrogen. Hydrogen doesn't have any simple synonyms, you know. Um, and so, so I have to like describe it by saying that it's the stuff that lifts those big flying sky boats that one of them fell down and burned once. And, <laughs> um, and you know, like, like I got to, it, it, and that exercise was so much fun that I, I, I was like, well, this, I could apply this to other things and try to explain those too. Um, and then ended up doing an entire book of them. Yeah, well, it just seemed to me, uh, in fact, um, after I finished going through it, I took it to my editor um, and I said, you know, I, you should read this because it tells us something interesting and useful about the language we use to describe really, really complicated stuff. And I know one of my own failings as a journalist is to adopt the language mm -hmm. of the people that I'm talking to. So, you know, scientists for all kinds of good reasons have a incomprehensible sort of jargonish psychobabble that they use to communicate with each other because they want to be precise. And in so doing, they exclude the rest of the world from what they're talking about. And what the two of you are so good about is knocking that down with the language that you choose to use that allows us to come back into it. I mean, is this yes, yes, but at the same time, um, I love that kind of language because it's sometimes used in the case of Masters and Johnson in their book, Human Sexual Response, because this was the 50s and because it was such a charged topic and because they needed desperately to present themselves as scientists. They could, would take any, you know, they would, to pornography, for example, became stimulative literature. Um, <laughs> If you lost your boner, it was a failure of erective performance. Um, they, you didn't even say a couple. They called the couple, the people who came into the lab, they were reacting units. So it was just this amazing language that they built to be respectable and scientific and to dodge criticism, which they got anyway. Um, but I, I just, I, I, I love to explore the language that people, that people create, whatever their discipline, and, you know, and it's sometimes surprising reasons for it. But off, but yeah, not just putting it, it in if, unless you're playing around with it or exploring it for that reason. But you know, to keep it, otherwise keeping it out. Yeah. So, do you find that sort of science as a general thing is starting to edge <coughs> into popular culture? Y yes and no. I mean, I think it's cu culture is very split right now. I think there's a there's a there's a segment of the population that are. Um, very dismissive and rejecting of science, and then there's this other world where um, things like Science Cafe and Wonderfest and, and all these fabulous science events 
pop-ups uh, that are attracting huge numbers of people to be able to come to hear scientists talk about their work. And it, they sell out, and people have a great time. So th it, it's a strange time right now when, when they're kind of these two extremes. Yeah, I think, I think that um, I'm always sort of hesitant when people are like, so you know, talk about this idea of, of um, you know, science edging into popular culture. Um, is that I, I, I feel like it's hard to get a good sense of, of whether it's really changing because that's the kind of thing where like, you know, there's this pop science stuff now, but then I know, you know, when I was a kid, there was things like Bill Nye and then, and then I know that before that there was uh, Mr. Wizard, which I think was a little before my time. And then, you know, but like maybe there were more things like that going further back and I'm not familiar yeah, with right. them. So, you know, I, I don't really know how you'd measure that. And, I, you know, I, I feel like someone, someone probably does, but, but like, I'm too in the present yeah. to get a good sense of whether or not um, yeah. people's attitudes are really changing or, or, you know, it's just the specific outlets are turning over. Do you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, so I was wondering if you've ever come across something that you tried to explain in simple language or stick figures that you just could not make it work. And if not, how do you keep making yourself get simpler and simpler until it does work? Uh, I, because I don't have a background in science, I come up against this fairly regularly. And um, uh, for example, in, in Grunt, I needed, to, uh, I needed to understand and explain decompression sickness. And, I, and I was, mm. uh, the person who was explaining it to me was just not able to explain it in a way, you know, it's kind of making sense, but it's still I'm like, yeah, but why do the, bu why bubbles form? And what, where do they go? Why, why? So I, I just um, went around the department and, and, and found, until I found somebody who seemed like you know, he could explain, it was just, uh, he was able to explain it in, in terms of the soda stream on your counter. And, and so I, I, this guy, I'm like, come to lunch with me. I will buy you lunch, and I need you to just talk to me, and I'm going to turn on my tape recorder. So I, I'll just keep going until I find someone who can express it in a way that I can understand well enough to take it apart and put it back together in my writing in a way that's accurate, that makes sense. So I, I, it happens to me all the time. I, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think... I think People were like, was there any concept that was hard to put in simple words? Um, and I think there were absolutely concepts that were hard for me to explain in simple words, but it was almost always something that would have been hard for me to explain in complex words, too. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like the simple word constraint. Um, it's sort of like the, it, like, like if, you, if you don't understand something in the first place, it becomes especially clear you don't understand it when you try to put it in simple words. But, but like the, the the workings of the animal cells, all the little parts of a cell. It's like so foreign, you know, in sort of the same way quantum mechanics is, it's so like removed from everyday experience that it's hard to even find analogies to talk about what they're doing. And, you know, it's hard for someone to understand regardless of what words you use. Um, and I feel like sort of the same way, um, you know, with, with, with stick, well, so with the stick figures, the one thing that I am limited by drawing stick figures um, is there's one kind of joke that I would totally do if I were doing traditional cartoons or any other medium. Um, I've always gotten a kick out of any kind of those tearaway suit gags, like where you tear away one set of clothing and you have a different one underneath. Um, and, and that's the one kind of thing where I just cannot do that with my medium. I, I, always, I like the idea of, of you have normal clothes and then underneath and, and then you you go up to someone and you say, would you like to go to a formal dinner? And you like yank off the clothes and you have like formal wear underneath. Like James Bond then, with the Yeah, scuba exactly. Suit. Yeah, and right. then they say, they say, no, I'm busy or whatever. And then you say, that's fine. And you've got another set of normal clothes underneath that. <laughs> um, and that's a, that's a joke. I can't do any version of that, but I keep wanting to. Because I, I, I can't draw, I don't have characters with like clothes. <laughs> And yet they never feel naked, those sticks. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, yeah, so it's, uh, thanks so much for both of you being here. It's really great to be in the same room as you. Um, so my question was, um, it's really difficult um, as a science writer to find freshness in both the ideas that you're working with 
um, and in the voice that you use. So I wanted to ask both of you how you both um, find freshness um, and don't just, you know, write as if you were in a rut, you know, constantly. Thank you. Randall? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I think that for me it, it's like if I'm if I'm if I'm trying to answer a question, you know, and I'm like, here's the answer, you know, that it's easy for that to be very cut and dried. And for me it's finding those those nuggets of things that I'm really excited about. And then, you know, I, I any any time where I'm like, I found this cool thing, I wanna show I wanna tell people how cool it is. You know, and like like and sometimes that means like I wanna I found this exciting. I want to try to convey to other people why this thing is exciting. Like, um, again, the, the, like the most boring topic imaginable, like the organizational chart for the committees for the, you know, waterfall um, management. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I think this is neat. I want to get that across to people. I'm going to talk about how there are these waterfall police. Um, yeah. And and I think that, I think it's just about like people can tell if you're. People can tell if you're bored by the thing yes. you're saying. There's, yeah. You can't really fake that, you know? Yeah, yeah, hmm. yeah. Um. Um, yeah, uh, on top of that, I guess I, I sometimes, uh, I find it useful um, to read, you know, there's certain writers who write about technical things, some, you know, science, sometimes history, like Bill Bryson is somebody who, hmm. um, there's n never a sentence that's just a flat sentence. It's, it's sometimes, it's funny sometimes, but it's always surprising and fresh. So reading him or reading Susan Orlean, there's some nonfiction writers that I read them and it just is a kick in the ass to like do better, be more careful, don't have a sentence that doesn't earn its keep. Just say, if it's not funny, it's gotta be written in not, a, not the way you'd write an email when you're in a mm -hmm. hurry. Because it, it, it's easy to get lazy, it's easy for me to get lazy. So sometimes it just um, reading the work of other people or you, just uh, someone to, like, just to inspire me to go further, spend more time, work at it harder. It, I just need to be reminded that there are people out there who do this really well and I should reach for that. So. Susan, Susan Orlean, who, do, who, who are you inspired by? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously a huge fan of, uh, of Mary's books. Um, uh, there was a, the, the, there are, um, what I really like are books, I, I really like books that take, take a thing that is around me, but that I didn't really put the pieces together. Um, and then I read the book and it's like suddenly I look at, when I'm looking at the thing, I'm seeing a different pattern to it all, or I've seen yes. like an underlying So like, I really like books like, like for me, uh, I, grew, I grew up in like a pretty rural area. Um, and never lived in a big city. And then I read Jane Jacobs' uh, oh. Death and Life of Great American Cities. And it was like mind blowing to me, you know, and that's right around, you know, written about the cities right around here. But, um, um, and I, I, you know, even if it's not funny, mm -hmm. you know, I, re I read a lot of stuff that's just humor, but I also really like reading the stuff that like I reveals a weird like world that like that. Book, there's um, a book about Rust. Mm -hmm. or, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, which you, you know, you think Rust, what? Why, huh? But then you start to read it, and it's just this huge, never-ending, massive mm -hmm. engineering challenge. The, you know, the military, anybody who builds a bridge, just corrosion is every. It's like running the planet. You know, and I like who thinks of, like that somebody uh, thought to write about that. Yeah. Oh my God, that's brilliant. Why? You know, uh, I don't know why nobody didn't. Nobody thought of that in the past. But yeah. it's, it does. You immediately hear it. You, you, when you hear it at first, you think rust. You wrote a book on rust, <laughs> and then you start to read it, and it's so interesting. You know that kind of thing is inspiring. Yeah, I, there was a book recently. It was, um, I think it was, is it uh, uh, Alan Weissman, the the world, oh, the world without, without us. us. Yes. Yeah, and yes. reading that, I feel like that. Um, yeah. This was a book, and it was like a sort of what if book, where it was yes. what if humans just disappeared all of a sudden? What would happen to all the stuff we had left behind? Um, and I, reading that, I felt like it it hit this tone of like, kind of these very mundane questions, like like what makes a barn fall apart when it's not tended, um, combined with really like kind of stepping back and, and, and meditating a little bit, like taking a long view of like, like what will be left behind of us. Yeah. It, it, it was in a very like big picture in an almost scary way. Yeah. And I loved that striking that balance between kind of like ride detachment and then like 
really getting thinking hard about what ha what have we done to the world and which parts of it mm -hmm. will stay done forever you know yeah. was it was a really interesting balance and I, after reading that that really inspired the, the last article there are a couple of articles in my book where I talked about um, about these kind of 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 uh, where I, I tried to hit that balance between like this mm -hmm. is kind of a silly simple topic but also gives us a big picture view yeah. in a kind of unexpected yeah, way. Yeah, because you're not expecting, like, I was just yeah. recently in, visiting a cousin in England and he said, we're gonna go to the Bobbin Museum. And I'm like, really? The, Bob the Bobbins in England are spools, they're wooden spools. It's, an ama it's a working museum, so it's like a steam powered machine that's got a, you know, a drive shaft that's in leather belts, it's, and it's, you know, they showed exactly how it was all done, so it turned out to be this exploration, just you know, in, in, in telling the story of these seemingly mundane, simple, boring things, it was the story of the Industrial Revolution and child labor, and, and just so many things played into this simple production of this little thing. I, you know, I think there's a book about the pencil, which is a similar. Oh, yeah, Henry Petrosky, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, I, I love that kind of book, yeah. So can we expect a book from you soon called The Bobbin? I mean, is that? Bo Bobbin. Bobbin, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, so we have a question from Twitter, actually from Ellen, who's trapped in her seat here. <laughs> um, so for Mary, um, with topics like uh, sex, the afterlife, war, how do you come up with the topic for your next book? And at what point does the one word title come to you? Thank you. Ah, well, sometimes I try to work backward, like flick. Duck. I don't know. I try. Like, I'll, I'll try to think what would be the book, but that, that's never actually panned out. <laughs> uh, but if you have any suggestions, you know, bring them on. Um, I uh, I find I find book topics. Sometimes one of them is, is lodged in the previous book. Spook grew out of a chapter in Stiff. Uh, Bonk was this one sentence about something Masters and Johnson had devised and uh, to document female sexual response from the inside. And I was like, ah, sex research next book. Um, other times, you know, I've got three related interesting tidbits from previous articles or people I met, and I just think what would, surely I can find 10 other related things to stuff in there and call it a book. So sometimes I do that, uh, um, but it's, it, that's always the hardest part for me to come up, to, to find another uh, book idea that will hold my interest for two years, be interesting to my readers. I, I find that the hardest, and it gets, you know, the low-hanging, roachable fruit has been picked. <laughs> <laughs> so it gets harder. So I'm, I'm open to your suggestions. Well, it kind of raises a, 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 an interesting question. Both of you, in your own ways, have perfected a kind of formula. Yes. Uh, that channels yeah. your inner whatever it is. Um, for you, it's the, it's the books with the one-word sensibility. Um, and for you, it's uh, the questions from other people who are working very hard to be clever, right, and quirky, because um, they, it's probably a form of hero worship, right, to um, come up with something that will really titillate Randall, you know, um, really challenge him. But also the, the format of a, of a cartoon strip, a continuing cartoon strip, which some people have found in the end exhausting and they stop. Uh, some famous examples of that. So I'm curious to the two of you, is this formula mm -hmm. that each of you have, I mean, is it, uh, is it liberating or is it, is it a trap? Is it what? Um, for, for me, it's how I'm, I'm happiest. I, I, it's, I love that kind of reporting and when I, and the reporting goes well, I love writing it up, um, but it is, um, it, because as I said, I've kind of gone down the more obvious mm -hmm. routes. Uh, it, it, become, it, it becomes more and more of a challenge to, to find a subject. I would, I'm open to trying something different, but I, I kind of view the world through the lens of mm -hmm. that kind of book and that formula, if you will. So I, tend, I, it, it, it's, I, I have not come up with, a, you know, with something that seemed, because it's, it's a risk, you know, you risk Will that be something I can do? Well, is this something I can do well? Do my readers, will they be like, what the hell? Where's the single word gross book that you promised us? You know, I, I, uh, so, it's, so it's not a, a shift I would, uh, I, I find easy to make, but I would be open to it. I don't feel trapped. I feel frustrated in that it gets harder and harder 
for me to come up with something that kind of works well there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, so one of the things I really like about about um, about doing the the uh, comics that I do is I think it would be a lot. It's a lot harder when with people who have sort of a cast of characters or an ongoing story that they have to tell, where yeah. every new update has to be pinned, you know, t tied to the previous one. Um, and I think that that would be more. Um, that, w that might feel more stifling over time, but what I love about 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 doing XKCD is being able to take whatever thing I'm working on, you know, that's interesting, and as long as it can be presented in the middle of a computer screen, you know, or on a, mm -hmm. then I can I can put a box around it and call it a comic, and no one can stop me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've we've had like inter I've had like interactive things, games. Um, um, and and you know charts uh, things where there's you know the maybe maybe no joke or punchline at all but it's like a really interesting view that I thought was cool um, and it's like a, a very open format and this, the what if questions are sort of the same way because I can jump from you know the the physics of a baseball undergoing nuclear fusion to again the the um, health and safety reports on vibration to the hydrological politics between the US and Canada. Um, so there's a lot of room um, that, you know, it, it's sort of like, it's just a very, very open template. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Um, so communi communicating science is a really challenging job. And uh, I'm curious if you, if you face any criticism from scientists and also related to this, and um, perhaps on behalf of all the scientists here in the room, um, like where do you draw in the line when you're trying to write about science and uh, you want to make sure that it's accurate and also have reached a certain kind of satisfaction, but also um, can be understood by the public and can be interesting? Uh, yeah. Uh, what was the first part of it? Where do you draw the line? Well, oh, and, and what was the first part? Uh, I think it, uh, um, you're writing about science. Do scientists uh, oh, 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 judge oh, your, oh, oh, your, oh, your? Do you piss um, people off? Oh, <laughs> um, not. I don't. I don't get that feedback directed at me from from scientists in in the book or outside the book. Um, I think when people, for the most part, when people like your book, that's when you hear from them. When they don't like your book, they go onto Amazon. So, and I don't read my, I don't read my Amazon reviews, so I can't entirely answer that question thoroughly. Um, but um, I, the feedback, because when I finish a book, I send a copy to everybody uh, whose time I wasted to the extent of an mm -hmm. afternoon or more. So those, and I've gotten mm. generally either no feedback or positive feedback. The no feedback people, I'm, I think they just probably haven't read it. I'm not sure. They're not. They're angry. I think I would 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 hear. So I think usually they're they're um, happy to have their work explained to a broader audience. I think if they didn't want that, they wouldn't participate. I always send a copy of the book before of my a previous book before uh, when mm, I when I approach I someone. I want them to know. Look, this is going to be very basic. It's not going to explain the, what you're interested in right now. The project that you're working on and you're passionate mm -hmm. about. It's very broad and and it's very simple compared to what you're involved in. So this is what I do, and if you don't want to be involved mm -hmm. in that, let me know. So for that reason, I think I don't get pe people. So, so you don't think there's like a, there are people seething on the E-ring of the Pentagon because you've set the cause of camouflage back 30 years <laughs> now? Uh, no, they're inviting me to speak at conferences. <laughs> I see. I see. Um, same yeah. question to you. I mean, the first part of her question. So you mm -hmm. deal with a, a reasonably com, uh, combustible group of people. Um, so uh, I think for my for my guide, part part of what part of what I use is is um, knowing that like I've I've been that guy. You know, the 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 really pedantic like this is technically not the right word to use here, or like this and like. Anytime I'm writing anything, I hear that voice in the back of my head, and I just have to decide, is this a situation where it's right to listen to that voice or not? <laughs> um, and, and one of the clearest examples of this was in um, Thing Explainer. I have my list of the thousand most common words, and I have a physics degree. And 
but in this list, I and and anyone who has any kind of physics background will appreciate this one. Um, the list had the word weight, but it did not have the word mass. Mm -hmm. And this is like the number one thing physics people get pedantic about is the <laughs> distinction between weight and mass. And every time I, I use the word weight, I just cringe and I could hear the, like everyone I knew being like, well, actually, you know. <laughs> um, and, and I really got to think about when, when is that distinction important and when is it not? Because like, I think that that fundamentally the goal is the same as with any kind of writing, which is to get the idea across clearly to the audience. And it might be a situation where like, you can use the right word that the audience won't understand, but if they're not gonna understand it, it's not the right word, yeah. you know? And so like, what you're trying to do is find the combination of words that gets them the closest to understanding what you're trying to say, and, and anything else is, is kind of irrelevant. And so, so I know that sometimes that means simplifying something or that means, you know, using a word that isn't quite the right word, but that's because the right word will give someone the wrong idea, which means it's the wrong word. Or they'll say, what is that? Yeah, you know, exactly. Like centrifugal and centripetal is another mm -hmm. one. That, <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So another, there are you. Yes. So my question is kind of similar. Um, as a scientist listening to you guys talk, it seems that a lot, of, I see, a lot of dichotomy in science writing and, and scientists and our worlds. And it seems that a lot of what kind of makes good science writing is your own curiosities and going out and finding something. But we often talk about bringing these two things together. So what as scientists can you, can we do, or that you hope scientists would do to kind of get our interesting and cool research that maybe in our science words is, doesn't seem that cool, but that then someone more eloquently can speak about, about it? I think I think a lot a lot of times um, science reaches the general public through the mechanism of um, a university public affairs or media person, and so um, it isn't. And there's I, I have the sense that there's just a tremendous amount of interesting work that doesn't get mm. into that machine. Uh, not a machine. That's the wrong word. But it just it doesn't reach that broadcasting system. So I guess I would encourage. Um, scientists to uh, make connections with s storytellers and science writers uh, and, and media people and journalists independently uh, and also take advantage of some of these things like in the Bay Area Science Cafe which is scientists um, coming and, and talking about you know in the Bay Area like the earthquake talks are popular uh, mm. so uh, I guess making direct connections rather than through the channels of the formal uh, public affairs or media people, maybe. Yeah. Certainly, Randall, I mean, you're an example of just doing it yourself. There are fewer barriers between yes, true. Right. a technical person um, and the story they want to tell and the people they want to hear it. There are very few. Yes. The Martian is another <laughs> example of a, um, a novel that was originally just published in installments on his own mm -hmm. website and it caught on and eventually did get published in traditional mm -hmm. publishing but just took off and and was just people kept recommending it and talking about it and that's just he decided to write it and put it out there yeah so that's a good point mm -hmm. do you have a question hello um, this is a question Hi. hey this is a really fun conversation um, I had a question about the XKCD um, climate change strip, because that got a lot of attention. So I was wondering, um, what made you do it? How did you research it? And what kind of feedback did you get? Um, <clears throat> uh, so I, I made a chart showing the, the um, uh, approximately the last 20-odd the last, uh, uh, thousand years of the Earth's climate um, to try to get across something that had, the, this is something that had, that had been, uh, I've been thinking about for a long time um, about how it's a really frustrating challenge um, from kind of presenting data point of view is getting across the idea that the climate has changed before, <clears throat> but the pace of change now is really different from anything we know about, you know, any time, um, you know, in the, in the, you know, human history. And then also that 
those changes that happened before that happened more slowly were very dramatic. You know, when we warmed up from the ice age, that was a change of about four degrees. And that was the difference between, you know, a, a mile of ice over, over Boston and Toronto and now. And now we're looking at going four degrees up in the other direction. And that's pretty dramatic. So I was thinking, but, but one of the problems is if you try to graph this data, you get, um, you either compress it to where the current climate change is just a vertical line at the end, or you stretch out to show the current climate change and then you don't have room to fit the rest of the graph to give context for just how far back you know, history goes. And then the scientist's response to that is to use a log scale um, to show these different orders of magnitude, except that erases the whole point that you're trying to get across, <laughs> which is how, because it'll show the, the old change and the new change looking kind of similar. And so I was really grappling with like, how do I present this? And, um, and then hit on uh, uh, one of the fun things about a web page is which is that you can have, have uh, an infinitely long document and scroll. And so I made it so it would, you would scroll in this kind of journey watching the temperature change over time. Um, and then even when I had that, it, that's a tough one because like, you know, it, it, talk about kind of a politically charged technical minefield. You know, there are climate scientists who get, uh, mm -hmm who get attacked with billboards, sure. like smearing them and like hacked, hacking their computers. Like it's a really politicized topic, but it's also a really important one. And so I spent a lot of time, I talked to a bunch of experts, you know, there's always the, everyone's like hedging really carefully and trying to decide like, what can they say with certainty? What can they say without being attacked? And so I spent a lot of time on that one, trying to get that right. Um, to where I was confident in the things I was saying and, you know, what I was leaving out. It was, it, but it's the same as, as any of those communication challenges. It was just a sort of more significant version. Um, so I, it is my sad yeah. task to keep us on the clock. And I, I want to offer our last question mm -hmm. um, here. Yes. Um, so, so speaking of difficult topics to cover, um, we've been talking about climate change and you know big ideas, but I've noticed with both of your work that you've both tackled love, and I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you could talk a little bit about the challenges as a science interested person, um, how to cover love. Thanks. Love. Mm -hmm. Why don't you start? Because I think that I mostly covered sex. <laughs> <laughs> Sort of synonymous, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a relationship. <laughs> but uh, yes, Randall, your, col your, your cartoon is relationships mm -hmm. in addition uh, to the other matters. Um, I don't know. I think I might even sort of tie that back to an earlier question about, um, you know, as scientists, like how do you bridge, um, how do you make things less opaque um, or, or you know, what can scientists do to bring things to the public, um, which is that my advice, whenever I'm talking to someone about like, what's the, what's the thing you're working on that you think could, you know, tell me something interesting that it could make it, you know, an interesting comic or whatever, or that I'm, I want to write about this thing. And, and I find that often they'll, they'll sort of try to think, well, what about my work is publishable? You know, what about, what is the significant result? How, what does my work mean for humanity? What do I say in a research pitch? And, and I found that a much better question to ask is like, which thing about what you're working on is really exciting? Or which thing do you, what, like get them to just talk about it, like what's the anecdote that you'd tell? Because what people care about really comes out. And scientists get excited about their work the same as anyone else. You know, like you're, you, you had the story about the, the, the uh, scientist working on saliva, who was just so excited about saliva. And like that excitement is what's interesting. Um, and that's what, that's the hook. And so, you know, scientists get excited about their work and that's what makes their work accessible. And scientists get excited about people and scientists have romance and, and you know, the same as anyone. And, and, and that's, um, you know, it, it's, it's more that we, like, that we would even think to cordon that off is sort of the weird thing. You know, it's like, mm. like to, to, to to think that it's weird to imagine that um, because, because scientists are excited about things too and scientists fall in love and, you know, and, and, and like, um, you know, that the, they're, you know, obviously, you know, we separate that out professionally, but then we sort of forget that these are human beings and, and they're excited about things. And I think that that's, 
part of what what that's you know what's uh, sometimes really interesting to talk about is the things that we are excited about, be they people or research or love. Well, love is love uh, as something to study in a in a precise scientific laboratory way. It's it's. Well, first of all, you have to define it, and then how do you know that the person who says they're in love actually knows that, you know, there's just, it's so squishy. <laughs> uh, that, so that it's, that I think it's traditionally been difficult to do any kind of a um, quantitative study of, of the effects of love, or how do you know this person is in love? They may think they're in love, and their definition of love may be completely different than someone else's, and so unless there's this agreed upon formula and definition, if you could somehow measure it. Um, but so anyway, I, there, there tends not to be a lot of laboratory studies on, on love. You know, there's, there's evolutionary biology and there's discussions of love and theories on love, but actually I didn't find, I mean, I would have loved to, I would have loved to uh, include it, but I, uh, I found a dearth of, of material mm -hmm. for that reason. Yeah, well, somewhere in that Oxford English Dictionary list of sub-definitions of love, surely there's one that would be the right word for the feeling of enjoyment that I think the audience here online and I have had this evening <laughs> <coughs> talking and listening to two deeply humorous people talk seriously about what they do. And I really thank you for the leaps that you've made with us here. And really, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.